You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that So the focus today is going to be on uh, questions, comments, and concerns. There aren't a ton of questions, so I may just go to the Facebook group and start plagiarizing some things, which is to say people posted things that were not intended to be on the podcast, but I'm going to take it anyways. We'll see how time stacks up. But anyways, as always, be sure to jump on iTunes. I'm really looking forward to getting to 200 so I can give that PFF subscription away. Otherwise, the uh, phone number to text or call any questions or comments that you have regarding the Green Bay Packers uh, is in the description. Feel free to drop it on in now. But we'll take our break. And again, as I said yesterday, uh, this is going to be a shorter podcast because I'm actually recording this on Saturday. Trying to hurry up because the family's up and getting crazy and wants to go camping. And they're starting to scream and get nuts. So we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, Do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So this question is going to come from uh, Jim, the bass fisherman down in Florida. I wanted to wish a happy Father's Day, first of all, so thank you, and happy Father's Day to all of you as well. Um, For your information, no, the rabbit is alive. I have not put it in a taco, but I appreciate you asking. I could not catch my breath for about 30 seconds. That was hilarious. Fortunately, I haven't had to resort to that yet. Um, Chicken is still readily available, uh, as is ground beef, steak, freezer meatballs, pretty much anything that I can put in there that's meat-related. Um, I have not had the need to kill the rabbit uh, at this particular point in time. But his it's not really a question, it's, it's more of a comment. But it actually somewhat ties into what I had said about Mike Pettin and uh, my concern that if things really go well that he may be on the, uh, the short list for head coaches. But he referenced Rex Ryan and um, said that Rex, Rex Ryan had a quote that it doesn't take long to realize Mike Pettin's the smartest man in the room. Um, looking up the uh, direct quote, First of all, the quote was, he's the smartest guy in the room. But beyond that, he goes on to kind of explain the process that uh, Rex Ryan had in discovering Mike Pettin and how smart he is. He says, I was trying to spice up my presentations, and the more I talked to him, I realized, holy cow, this dude knows everything. He's a real football guy. So when we had the chance, we made him quality control coach, then outside linebackers, then defensive coordinator. He was my right-hand man forever. He goes on to say that he took a job in Buffalo not because he fired him, he said, Rex, Rex Ryan said, I never fired him. He told him to leave and take a job somewhere else because a new general manager came into the Jets job and he was going to fire everybody and everybody knew they were all about to get fired. 
So he kind of just said, you know, you go, I'll stay here and, and you know, take the, the slicing and dicing that's coming. And then, of course, after Buffalo, when he goes there and turns them into a dominant group, he ends up getting a head coaching job. Now, the only saving grace here is that that didn't go very well at all. Now, it's the Browns, but still, maybe that leaves a bad taste in somebody's some people's mouth, and he's a defensive coordinator, so some teams just wouldn't touch him anyways. But anyways, those were Rex Ryan's comments about how much he likes him, and then I went on to say essentially how valuable he is to this team, the fact that he's, in my mind, he's basically co-head coach. I mean, you have the head coach who's sort of the ultimate decision maker, um, but he's said outright that he leans on Mike Pettin because he has head coaching experience. And beyond that, LaFleur has zero say on that defense. Mike Pettin is running that by himself. So LaFleur does the offense, and I would say Pettin has more control over the defense than LaFleur has over the offense. Maybe not control, but I mean, you know, LaFleur has a lot of input from the offensive coordinator and a bunch of other people. Pettin is the, the patriarch of the defense, and he also is the you know, advisor to the head coach as far as how to be a head coach. So I, I think Pettin's power on this team is, is pretty high, his power and his influence and whatnot. But what Jim had go on, gone on to elaborate and say was essentially that our GM has kind of realized what Rex Ryan had said and how valuable Mike Pettin is. And then, you know, you heard the comments about how, you know, LaFleur, it was strongly suggested that he not fire uh, Mike Pettin. But he says that he believes that uh, Brian Gutekunst realized uh, what Rex Ryan had said to be true, and that little by little the team is being built around Mike Pettin. So, you know, depending on what exactly that means, because that was there was a period at the end of that, I guess I can agree. I mean, you, you look at, um, again, how much value he clearly holds, how talented he is, um, his experience makes him, you know, probably the most veteran and experienced and, to be completely honest, capable head coach in the entire building. I think keeping him happy and, um, you know, stocking up his defense and and doing whatever it takes to keep him on board is going to be pretty important to the Packers organization. Now, if we want to go and take this down into cross the line into conspiracy theories, which I haven't done in a while, I've been ultra cautious because it's the off season. Everybody just gets into crazy town. So I play opposite world and go the other direction. I usually get into my conspiracy theories in the regular season, but let's say the LaFleur thing doesn't work out super well. Let's just say Let's say the defense dominates, Mike Pettin continues to grow, his reputation continues to grow, the dynamic between Rodgers and LaFleur isn't really working, the offense isn't really going very well, Rodgers clearly wants complete control over this offense, and then an extra added dynamic is that Mike Pettin is getting phone calls for head coaching jobs. Now, posing the question to you would be, would there be anything in your mind, because it would be in my mind, is there anything in your mind that says we should fire LaFleur which I know is just upsetting people because this is the part of the season where we talk about how crazy, awesome, freakishly great he's going to be and all that stuff. But again, hypothetical, he's not super great. Should we fire LaFleur and hire Mike Pettin to be the head coach? Or do we keep this thing that isn't working in LaFleur, lose our defensive coordinator who built a really good defense, and then basically just risk being just a terrible team, right? We have an offense that isn't working. We lose our defensive coordinator, so our defense goes back to being trash. What do you do? And it's it's not that far away. I mean, it... We're one season of high defensive production, low offensive production away from essentially staring this question right in the face. And essentially, I believe how this would run is that Mike Pettin would be the head coach. He would have primary oversight, similar to Rex Ryan, over the defense. Um, But play calling duties would fall on the offensive coordinator, whether that's still Hackett or maybe somebody else. Probably with Aaron Rodgers being the kind of guy he is, let's just get somebody that, that is in sync with him. If the offense isn't working, keeping Hackett maybe isn't the smartest plan but just find a capable offensive coordinator to call plays that has a good relationship with Aaron Rodgers and makes this thing work. I'm not saying this is a good scenario. This is, this is almost worst case scenario in my mind, but it, is it impossible? I don't think it is. And again, if things go south minus the defense, would you consider hiring Mike Pettin or would you look to hire somebody? Well, obviously there's another option. Let's give LaFleur another year because it's still early and takes a while for people to get acclimated, et cetera, et cetera. But let's say that was out the window. Would you just say, forget that, let's go find a new head coach, new offensive coordinator, and try to keep Pettin as a defensive coordinator? Or would you be concerned that we are going to lose this guy? I don't know. Hopefully we don't have to find that out. Hopefully Pettin is sort of untouchable as a head coach. He sticks around, the defense continues to grow, and the offense does fine. I'm just just saying. And I do agree, ultimately, with what Jim is saying, that I think 
Patton is very valuable, and I think the Packers realize that. The next question now, turning over to uh, the Facebook group, is going to be kind of tough to answer, but uh, the question is from Kyle. He says, uh, would it be worth keeping the D-line to a minimum as far as roster spots to keep as many wide receivers as possible? Keep Lowry, Daniels, Clark, and Lancaster and or Montrevious just so you can keep MVS, EQ, GMO, Kumaro, Davis, and Jamon. Also with Gary and Z being versatile, that's two less guys on the D-line you might need. I think traditionally speaking, you're not going to sacrifice D-line for wide receiver because D-line you just need more. I think that's also been historically true, although the Packers, more so than most teams, keep a lot of wide receivers. But I do understand the sentiment as far as with Zadarius and Gary also being able to play inside. But So we know we're going to keep Mike. Well, we don't know that, but unless something crazy happens. we got Mike, we got Kenny for sure. we got Kingsley Kiki, um, and Montrevious I don't think is going anywhere. So that's going to be four for sure. The, the other part of that that's difficult is when you construct a 53-man, it's possible to do both if we sacrifice in other areas. Or we might do neither if we want to ba- build up other areas. You know, So it's, it's kind of hard to say for sure. But in this specific example, would you be willing to keep four so that you can keep, specifically in your example again, MVS, EQ, Geronimo, Kumaro, Davis, and Jamon? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm still leaning toward no. I mean, if, if you look at the wide receivers, we're going to keep MVS, almost positive we're going to keep EQ, really positive, pretty positive we're going to keep Geronimo. Um, the next three, not to- totally sure. Um, I think Jamon would be next on the list. As, I, don't, I don't think most people would agree, but I would put Jamon next because the Packers want to see what he's able to do. After that would be Davis because of what he's doing so far, but again, it's way too early to tell. Uh, he's going to have to really be able to step it up and show that he can do something and either be a really productive special teams guy and they want to go that route or step up as a wide receiver. The last one is Kumaro. I've been pretty consistent in saying I think he's got a, a, a tough road. And I, I listen, I like Kumaro. I just, I don't know. I mean, it, there's again, there's a lot of people that do really well prior to the season that come into the regular season and don't do all that much. Kumaro is one of those guys. So just even in this one specific, if, if we were to get super specific and say, would you rather have you know, Lancaster as another, you know, big nose tackle, or Kumaro as your, you know, sixth wide receiver, I'd take Lancaster. But again, it's really hard to get into the specifics of it. Well, we'd have to see with a full breakdown of the 53 to see what it would take in order to make each of these things happen. And I'm not planning on doing that. I did one a while ago, just preliminarily, but I don't plan on doing another one until later in the season when we get to that cut down portion. But that was my thoughts on that. Anyways, let's take one more quick break, and then we'll jump into a few more of these um, question-y, comment things. Kind of going back a little ways now, when I was doing the whole, uh, you know, breaking down each position in the NFC North and, and my thoughts on it, um, apparently some Vikings fans took exception to the idea that Kyle Rudolph wasn't super great, not specifically to me, but uh, Ben in the Facebook group had been talking to a lot of Vikings fans and he said even non-Vikings fans are saying that he's a top five tight end. And he's just wondering if he's crazy or what's going on. I think the point is, with a lot of people, you have name recognition. And there's also the media. And the media hypes up Kyle Rudolph. Again, the media is the one that's been saying Kyle Rudolph is really, really good. And I've been saying on the side, nah, not really. So I think there's just this general assumption that he's good until he, people are told otherwise. Because they don't know. They're not watching the Vikings every week. But anyways, I, I just want to go through and, and look at, um, I know somebody else had asked the question, I don't remember exactly when or where, but the question was essentially, is he even top five in any single category? Really quickly, just want to run through and see what PFF has to say about Kyle Rudolph. This is going to be grades as well as advanced stats. First of all, no, Kyle Rudolph is not a top five wide receiver. In fact, he is not even graded as a top 32 wide receiver, which would make him a number one on uh, any given team. He's Barely even in the top 64, which would make him a number two tight end on any team. Kyle Rudolph had a uh, was ranked 52nd of all tight ends. Now, if we adjust for a couple of other, you know, minimum snap counts or whatever, Kyle Rudolph rockets up to 27th, but that's out of 41 total tight ends. Bottom line is his grade was average. He was beneath Nick Vanette of Seattle, Rhett Ellison of the Giants, Jesse James of Pittsburgh, David Njoku, Greg Olson, who, you know, sounds great, but he had a, he's on a steep decline, um, Eric Ebron, Austin Hooper, Nick Boyle, Blake Jarwin, Trey Burton, Antonio Gates, Vance McDonald, Benjamin Watson, Jack, I mean, you get the point, right? 
And yes, for any Vikings fans who are wanting to pop off about he's better than any pet, that's fine. But nobody in Green Bay is talking about having great tight ends. You guys are. That's sort of the difference. As a receiver, again, out of uh, 41, he was ranked 22nd. So no, he's not top 5. He's not top 10. He's not top 15. He's not top 20. He's 22nd. Now, he is top 5 in A category here as far as grades, and that is drops. Great hands. He's actually graded number 1. He had an elite grade, the only tight end with an elite grade. Um, one drop on, let's see, 76 targets, 64 receptions, only one drop. So he's got good hands. That's, that's cool, man. Good job. Getting into some stats, yards per reception, he was 29th. Yards after the catch per reception, 31st, which is pretty bad. Longest reception, he was 14th. First downs, he was 7th, so that's pretty good. He's getting a lot of first downs for the team. Not top five, but close. Um, avoided tackles, he was 15th. And then passer rating when targeted, he was 8th. Again, pretty close, but he's not top 5. If we look at him as a blocker, because we're trying to find somebody that's well-rounded, this is out of 81 tight ends, he was 58th. Uh, 58th as a pass blocker, he was graded as below average. As a run blocker, he was graded 59th. Also, again, below average. If we look at uh, the proprietary advanced stats, yards per route run for the tight end group, Out of 40 tight ends, he was graded 28th at 1.19 yards per route run. For reference, George Kittle was number one, 2.83 yards for every route run. For further reference, Jimmy Graham was one spot below him at 29th at 1.16. So as far as this metric, Jimmy Graham and Kyle Rudolph were exactly the same. So no, he is not a top five tight end. Um, He is not graded as a top five tight end by people who are watching film. He does not have top five stats in just about any category with the exception of his um, drop grade, which is not even necessarily a drop rate. But there you go. I I don't know what else to do. I don't know how, if you paid me $1,000 to twist this information into him being top five, I don't even know where I would begin. I don't have a clue how to do it. Considering he just got another contract, I can't even do it based on value because he wouldn't even be close. You got guys who are getting paid pennies who are doing better than he is. You got guys that are older like Vernon Davis who are getting higher grades than him. I, I got nothing, man. I just got nothing. He's not top five. It's not even close. He's a uh, he's mediocre at best. He's right smack dab in the middle. Uh, Ryan Pug, I think is his answer, had a question about uh, PFF. He was curious if they have uh, special teams grades. In fact, they do. Uh, he asked, is it you know beyond kickers and punters? And yes, they do. Uh, he said he'd be curious how they rank uh, and all the micro aspect of it. Now, they don't have super in-depth stats. They, they do grade each person on their whatever their task was. But I, I don't think I can look at the long snapper and, and see what his long snapping grade was. That's not a thing. But let, let's run through some of what we can find here. So there's a lot of people that played special teams Um, Just to give you some idea, as you pointed out, not a lot of people doing very well, and that's true. Only two people had grades that were considered good, according to PFF. Several that were close, but the only two that were considered good were Oren Burks and James Crawford. Oren Burks had seven tackles, two assists, and one missed tackle. James Crawford, six tackles, one assist. Um, As far as what they were doing, I mean, Oren Burks played uh, kick return, kick coverage, punt return, punt coverage. Uh, James Crawford was all that, plus field goal blocking. A few honorable mentions, uh, Ibrahim Campbell, Tremont Williams, Trevor Davis, and Reggie Gilbert all had pretty good grades. They do have specific grades on kickoff, punt, and field goal, but I believe these are just for kickers, return men, etc. So, for example, Tremont Williams, his punt grade was 36. It was horrific. Uh, Trevor Davis was kind of average as far as his kickoff and punt and whatnot. Um, I don't want to go through all this because there are 63, but uh, to point out, and, and this is important too because I mentioned this several days ago, when we talk about Mason Crosby and the troubles he was having, I said it's not fair that we talk about him and not the fact that we never bring up Hunter Bradley. Hunter Bradley had the worst grade of anybody on special teams. He had a 33 grade. He was terrible. So yes, Mason Crosby's going to miss some kicks when you got a, a long snapper that's burying balls in the dirt, not to mention a new holder as well. But Hunter Bradley, Josh Jones, Jamal Williams, Fatal Brown, uh, Robert Tanyan, and Danny Vitale all had really bad grades. Josh Jones and Hunter Bradley were abysmal. The other four were uh, really bad. Um, And then you've got between 50 and 59, you've got, uh, geez, 30 players 
Uh, Devon House, Darius Jackson, Tony Brown, Kevin King, Jay Kumro, Kentrell Bryce, Josh Jackson. I'm just going from worst to best. We're up to about 55 now. Josh Jackson, Antonio Morrison, Corey Toomer, Aaron Jones, Kyler Fackrell, Eddie Pleasant, Natrell Jamerson, Levon Coleman, Jamon Moore, Lucas Patrick. It's all pretty bad. A handful of average and above average. And then, again, you've got two guys that played well, and that's about it. Uh, they also do have uh, return grades. Nobody graded out as good in this. The best was Bashad Breland. Uh, at 65, which is average. Marquez, Trevor Davis were both average. Everybody else was below average or worse. Josh Jackson was the worst with an abysmal grade. Tremont Williams and Jamon Moore had terrible grades. Uh, Jair, Ty Montgomery, Jamal, Kevin King, Lucas Patrick, Randall Cobb, and Antonio Morrison all had below average grades. Obviously, Lucas Patrick was on some kind of a squib kick or something. He actually had two returns, so that's kind of weird. And then as far as kicking... Um, Field goals, Mason Crosby had a below average grade. Again, I don't know how much of that is the long snapper's fault or his fault. Maybe it's a combination. I don't know. But he was 94.4% on his extra points, 81.1% on his field goals, um, 100% from 20 to 29 yards, 90.9%, basically 91% from 30 to 39, 73% from 40 to 49, and 71, 5 of 7, and 50 plus. So it kind of seems like it's that 40 to 49 range that you'd like to see better. I mean, I I feel like 71%, 5 of 7 from 50 out isn't bad. And obviously 91%, uh, 10 of 11 from 30 yards out and 100% from 20 yards out, I don't think that's problematic. So it's just the fact that he missed four in that 40 range, that's probably not great. And again, how many of these are because of bad snaps? That might negate, even if it negates half of them. We're looking at maybe 13 of 15 from 40 yards out and 6 of 7 from 50 yards out. Um, and then J.K. Scott, uh, super high upside, but, you know, didn't exactly pan out like you'd hope. But even he, it wasn't bad compared to everybody else. It was a 64.2 as far as his punting grade, which, again, isn't great. And especially considering his potential, he should have done a lot better. And hopefully the new special teams guy can help him out a lot. But he was 19th, so he was average. He wasn't terrible. Uh, it just doesn't meet the expectations of where he was drafted. You know, 44.7 yards per attempt, which I know is a flawed metric because it depends how close you are. But even so, with his leg, you would expect that to be a little bit longer. Uh, He graded out 27th out of 38 in net yards. 67 was his longest, which was 9th. Kicks inside the 20, he was 16th. So it just, you know, wasn't really top of anything. The one exception would be hang time because he just absolutely bangs the heck out of these things. Um, 4.52, he graded out as the top punter. So, I mean, he's got a heck of a leg and a lot of potential, um, but he's got to get it tightened up a little bit. But yes, there are uh, statistics. If anybody has any questions specifically about a person or whatever, or what they're doing, I don't have a ton of information. I can tell you how it broke down in terms of where he lined up and what he was doing and and all that kind of stuff and overall grade. But yeah, that's a thing. And that's the best I can tell you as far as uh, where our special teams lined up. Overall, as everybody understands, it was, it was not good. It was pretty bad. The penalties were high. Production was low, and it's, it's got to get better, and um, hopefully we can see a little bit of that. So, anyways, uh, going to be kind of ultra short today, but again, um, kind of do it back-to-back, and I'm really running late, so I'm going to cut it off here. Uh, you folks have yourselves a fantastic Sunday. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one.